the woke housing situation in California. It's causing people to leave the state. And even more common than that, it's causing people to have their money leave the state for greener pastures. And that's what we're talking about. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS, and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to the MLS Search and Analysis Show. This is Holden Wise TV. I'm James Wise, and I help people like you invest your money where it makes sense, Okay. Now, my client, Adon, auto tech from sunny California, right? Adon likes the sunny weather. Who fucking wouldn't, right? I mean, goddamn, the weather out there in California is beautiful. But you know what's not beautiful? Woke-ass housing policies that just shit all over your freedom and shit all over your returns, right? I'm not saying you got to leave California to make money in real estate. No, I don't think you need to do that at all. But what I think you need to do is what Adon is doing and have your money leave California. Have it go somewhere where it makes a little bit more sense, right? Now, all that aside, crazy woke policies, they make things difficult for landlords, right? So being a landlord in California, whew, that's a punishment that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. But... The housing prices, as they are insane, it is a double-edged sword, right? They're super high, and people like Adon, they want to send their money elsewhere because they can't afford to get into the game. And then if they do get into the game, the market, it's just insane with the the woke policies and laws, right? It's insane, right? But double-edged sword, being fair, that's what I try to do. I try to be fair. If you're trying to buy real estate in the hopes that it appreciates at a high rate, California does make a lot of sense with all of its problems, it is still in demand. It is still probably the nicest weather in America, if not the world, right? There, there's Hollywood. There's, there's a lot of good stuff to it, right? But specifically, those folks that are looking for cash flow real estate, cash flow real estate on a budget, and want to have a reasonable ownership experience like a Don, sending your money outside of California might make sense, right? And that's where I come in. That's what my team does. $200 million worth of investment real estate sales in the Cleveland market would never advocate for somebody having to move from sunny California to Cleveland, especially if we're talking about the fucking weather. Jesus fucking Christ, does the weather in Cleveland suck? It fucking sucks. I've literally fucking shoveled snow and cut grass in the same goddamn week, right? But hey. That, everybody, every place has its problems, right? California, might be 70 and sunny, but, you know, there's a fucking homeless guy in the corner of your fucking street with million-dollar houses, right? I, I'd probably rather cut my grass and shovel snow in the same market. But again, I'm not, I'm not trying to get anybody to move, right? Let me not get off into these tangents. The thing is, though, right, the pricing, folks. The pricing is insanely cheap, and you can enjoy living where you want but still have the freedom to invest where it makes sense when you have a company like mine who could handle all the on-the-ground stuff. Property management, maintenance, construction, insurance, the whole nine. But it starts, it starts with education, right? And what I do is I break down these properties for you guys in a transparent way. The property I found for you today, Adon, I am not the seller. I have not been hired by the seller. I am working solely for you. And as a matter of fact, I want to show you how to beat that seller up and try to chop $30,000 off of his price. Let's jump into a deep dive on those numbers right after this. Hey, lenders, would you like to be part of our referral network? Send us an email at sales at holtonwise.com. Welcome back. Let's jump right into these numbers. And I like this one uh, quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I actually grew up on this street when I was uh, just a wee little lad. 4123 Bucyrus Avenue, Cleveland, 44109. It's been on the market for 12 days. Now, this is a C-class neighborhood, okay? C-grade neighborhood. Um so for those of you that thought that I was like always just some rich asshole, no, 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 no. self-made, 
rich asshole, folks, all right? Come by it honestly, right? Grew up in the C-grade neighborhoods today. We manage hundreds of properties just like this one. Now, this one is listed at 139000 and that is actually, in my opinion, going to create an opportunity, right? What we're dealing with here in the Cleveland market, it's hot. Okay, the Cleveland market is ridiculously hot. It's one of the cheapest markets in the country, right? So when investors are trying to stretch their dollars, we get a lot of them coming here to Cleveland, all right? Duplexes in this area, 100, 110, 115, that's usually what they're going for, okay? So what happens is when people, sellers, they put up a property at like 100 or 110, the prices, man, they just get like, the, the, the property just gets bid and bid and bid and bid and investors are just battling each other and it creates like this bidding war, right? And uh, that could be frustrating for investors, right? You're putting out offers, you're putting out offers and you keep getting overbid and then the pricing, you know, the property just ends up getting sold for more than what you thought, right? This particular seller and listing agent, they made a b big, huge mistake, right? They overpriced the sucker. 139 ain't nobody paying no 139 But I like that. I like that for my investors because... Oftentimes, we could take these overpriced properties and we could squeeze in our offer that's a reasonable price and uh, they're getting no traction on it because they priced it so high. And uh, a lot of times you end up seeing huge, huge discounts off of the list price when they do that, right? Because here's the deal. I think 110 is a reasonable price for this. If you listed it at 110, it's going to sell around 110. If you listed it at 140, it's going to sell around 110. Either way, it's probably going to sell there, right? I would probably even argue as a seller, uh, you probably end up with a higher uh, closing price on this property if you listed it at like 110 even uh, versus 139. Sellers seem to think that if you listed it at 139, uh, you'll get a higher price than if you listed it at 110. It doesn't really work that way in the real world, right? In the real world, uh, people see the good deal, and then, you know, that's when the bidding wars start, right? This one, the seller, they just think that nobody wants to buy their house, right? It's not not the case, man. There'd be a whole bunch of investors interested in this particular house, but they're not because it's priced too friggin' high, right? And that's why I like it, guys. We could put in those offers, and then nobody else bids on them. We stand a good chance of, of lowballing these folks, right? Now, we don't have any photos uh, of the inside, but that's okay. That's normal, right? Looking at the chart here, you can see that the market rents on this $750, $1,500 a month, $18,000. Now, that's not the current rent, right? The current rent, we can see it's actually on the screen here, right? $650 a pop, okay? And that's because... That's, that's also why there's not a lot of pictures, right? When you got the listing agent, they're trying to sell this particular property, right? Tenants, they don't like people coming in, bothering them. They make things difficult, right? But here's what we have. We have two tenants already, and they're paying six fifty. dollars We know the market rent is seven fifty. dollars It's not really that relevant to me what the interior looks like, right? What we want to do as investors is keep these two $650 tenants in there as long as we possibly can, right? If they do turn over... Doesn't really matter what it looks like now because you're doing a, a, a turnover, a rental turnover anyway. Paint, floors, wall, you're probably knocking that out. I think they've been there a while, so you're probably updating the kitchen and the bath, right? So you want to keep them in there as long as is humanly possible. Uh, we're going to do a third-party home inspection, assuming your offer gets uh, accepted. So barring anything like totally insane, like they gutted the sucker, the interior, it's not really that relevant. So the fact that we don't have any photos doesn't really matter. And when we're looking at the numbers, I want you guys to think of the numbers in the long-term perspective, right? Yes, the tenants are paying six fifty dollars right now, but six fifty dollars is not really the market rent. What we see is seven fifty dollars for these units. Again, we have hundreds of these suckers, right? So long-term perspective, if we get this at the price, I think it is worth, right? 110,000. Yeah, I know they think it's worth 140. It ain't. Or 139, whatever they're saying. 110. If we pick it up at 110, right? And we base this off of market rent. It's 1500 a month coming in. Approximately 9,475 is what I believe it's going to cost on average to to operate a property like this. And again, we have hundreds of these suckers, so, you know, I I guess I got a pretty good basis for that opinion, right? So that should kick off an NOI, a clean NOI, 
of approximately 85 a year. At 110K, you put down 27.5. The bank kicks in 82.5. That would project out to a 16% cash on cash return or an 8 cap, right? That's assuming you got the rents up from 650 to the 750. If you re ran your numbers again based on the current rent, 1300, still kicking off good cash flow. What you don't want to do is get greedy and try to buy it and then immediately try to go 100 bucks for both of these tenants, right? Because that might create a turnover, an artificial turnover. I like to go slow, right? The first year, I usually like to actually keep the rent the same, right? Because once a property changes hands, once it turns over, once Holton Wise comes in and takes it over, you know, I'm guesstimating based on the fact that this property was listed so much higher than it's actually ever going to sell for, in my opinion. I'm guessing it's like a mom and pop landlord who's not really a professional in the business, right? So there's no bigger difference between a mom and pop landlord and like one of the biggest names in town, Holton Wise, coming in and managing it, right? From a tenant perspective, these two things are on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, right? With the mom and pop, they probably have their cell phone number. They probably know them personally. There's probably a lot of back and forth, right? Holton Wise, you know. It's like kind of anonymous, right? Like you be an out-of-state investor. They don't know you. We have policies in place. You know, they got to dial a prompt system to talk to our staff. You know, there's staff of 60 here. So it's a big organization, totally different, right? So a lot of times when an investor buys a property, the tenants in that time, they're like, oh, no, they're scared. They're thinking things are totally going to change. Big, bad corporation comes in. Things are going to be different. Rents are getting jacked up. You know, it, it creates like uh, anxiety for them, right? So when we could come in, take it over, and the rent is still reasonably close to market, we have the ability to be like, hey, man, it's all good, dude. Holton Wise, we're here. You know, let's get you on our lease so you know our rules, our policies, our procedures. But guess what? We'll lock in your rent at the same rate. You don't have to worry about your rent increasing now that there's a sale. That puts the tenants at ease, okay? And it's not like we're doing it just to be nice to them, right? We're, of course, doing it uh, for the bottom line, right? And we're doing it for two reasons. One... As I already said, we want to keep them there as long as we can. We don't want to do a turnover. You want to save that money. Eventually, you're going to have to do a turnover, but why create an artificial one? That's one. And then two, the moment we take it over, we want them on our leases, right? Because at the very least, being on an old owner's lease, at the very least, it can cause an issue at the eviction, right? What the tenants can typically do if they decide not to pay the first month's rent to us, it's very simple for them to claim to the judge, hey, I didn't know. I, I was trying to pay my old landlord. I wasn't sure. Now, they don't win because of that. I don't want you guys freaking out thinking they win. No, they don't win that fucking case, right? We still win and we still kick their asses out of the house. Don't think we don't. But what typically happens when the tenant, you know, uses that defense, the judge sometimes will grant a continuance, right? I've seen that happen. They grant a continuance or they want to kick it to mediation. Uh, they want to give the tenant time. So when a continuance or something of that nature is granted, what that means is that's probably another seven, 800 bucks out of your pocket because everybody's got to go back to court it's another few weeks, things of that nature. So we could avoid all that. We could avoid that when we have a signed lease right then and there. Tenant can't claim that because we have their signature on our lease. They can't claim they didn't know who to pay, right? So those are the two scenarios of why you want to keep these folks in there, and that's why I don't like to up their rent, try to go right from where they are to market, right? So I'd probably keep them in there at 650. Again, run your own numbers uh, based on the current rents if you want. Not really that important, though, in my opinion, because it still cash flows, and that is just looking at the property at a one small point in time. you got to look at this in its totality, right? In its totality, what it's going to do for the long haul it's a $1,500 a month rental, not a $1,350 rental, right? Remember, you're not buying these two particular tenants. You're buying the asset and you're buying the tenant base, right? But while these two tenants are in there, they are an advantage to you, right? They are a benefit to you. So I like to keep them in there. And then when it comes time after that lease, the anxiety has gone. Then you try to go up like $25, $50, bucks, things of that nature. So with all that said... I think this would be a solid investment so long if we could pick it up at that 110k price point. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.